Thanks for the opportunity to present this lecture to you guys. These guys see me all the time, so it's not so new for them. But um, uh, Kalkidan asked me to give a lecture on my practice and my projects. Um, and so I, don't, I haven't done a lecture like this for quite a while, so I sat down and, and went through some of my projects and also my students haven't really seen all of this, so I'm just using it as a bit of an opportunity to um, reflect on, on my practice and what I've been doing in my research for the last 30 years since I've been in landscape architecture. And so really, this story starts in the 1980s. And uh, I, finished, I never finished high school, so I never got in trick. And so instead I, I did an apprenticeship when I was 16 years old as a landscape uh, a landscape contractor or as a landscape tradesperson and uh, I worked for a, a landscape contractor who was building gardens in Sydney and um, I studied at, at a technical college at, at night and on one day of the week and during that time it was the 80s and it was very much all about indigenous plants and what they call bush, bush gardens in Australia at that time. And I was living in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and working in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, which is around Bondi and these famous places you might have heard of in Sydney in Australia. And at that time, uh, I only, the only reason I ended up in landscape architecture was because of the fact that um, when I dropped out of school, uh, my friend of my mother's said, Julian can, uh, can sweep the yard of the house that she stays at of the flats and I thought I've got nothing else to do I failed at school I've got nowhere else to go and so I may as well just start sweeping this yard for a few a few dollars and then this friend of my mother said I've just got this new bank card and I can pay for things on the phone and on the radio they announced courses in gardening and since you're sweeping my yard maybe you want to be a gardener and I thought well, I've got nothing else better to do, so I may as well just be a gardener. And so I started going to this horticulture college, and during that time, it was, it was actually at that particular college, it was a real renaissance for that college, where they had lots of landscape architects teaching there. And so between 1986 and 1993, so about, what's that, four, seven years, is it? 1986 to, but for that seven years, I, I worked as a gardener and got skills and eventually I, um, about four years, five years into it, I started my own, my own garden construction company called Indigenous Landscapes and, uh, and I worked a lot in these trying to, re to restore um, these landscapes. And so this is one of my, this is the kind of first contract that we got um, and this was working in this really steep slope in the eastern suburbs and, um, and it was really uh, about making things. So the, we only, the only time I ever drew a plan, there was no plan, even though I was trained to draw plans. Most of the time we were just building things where we were working on construction methods for retaining slopes. So for example, these are a whole lot of sleepers that interlock with each other and you pour concrete into them to hold onto the slope. We were propagating native plants, um, building decks, etc., and that kind of work. And after that, I got a job working for a council in Sydney where I was working on ecological restoration work where we were revegetating an old tip site called Trumper Park in Sydney. And so I went and visited this top site. I worked there in the 80s, and I went and visited that site in 2002. And I was really amazed to see that what had been a complete weedscape had actually turned into a quite a, a healthy... Um, rainforest, which is what we propagated those plants and did that. And so that really started, um, and in the, at the end of that process, when I finished my, my tech course, my, I said to my, one of my lecturers, what should I do now? And he said, well, you're not really suited to this whole contracting thing. Maybe you should actually go to university. And there was a university in Melbourne called RMIT, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And it was the only place you could go and get into without having a matriculation. And so I put together a portfolio of all this indigenous stuff I was doing and I got admitted to that place and I moved to this city called Melbourne. 
And it was a very interesting process because while Sydney was a city that was very focused on landscape and focused on um, uh, plants and stone and naturalness, Melbourne is a city which is very, very cultural. It had it was a very flat city, it didn't have a lot of topo uh, topography, and it was very much about the city. And for me, I'd never been really thought of the city of, 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 of cities because Sydney was very much a city in the landscape. And so when I moved to Melbourne, I deliberately reinvented myself completely from being the guy who dropped out of school and, and had just become a contractor. And instead, I moved into this place where the, the landscape school was really radically changing. And so over the next three years, I, I was working at that, or studying there at RMIT, and it was going through a period which is now called post-structuralism, which is really a period where philosophy, ideas from philosophy, were coming into um, design, and where methods of what you might call design generation were being explored. And if you've heard of the work of people like Daniel Liebskind and, um, and Peter Eisenman and those kind of architects, we were really interested in trying to play with those. And so this was my, my dissertation um, project when I was, uh, in 1995, uh, when I was studying. And so it was quite a, at that stage, computers were really quite new in landscape. And, and so I was the only person in Australia at that time who knew how to use AutoCAD and so in landscape architecture. And so I was able to, well, maybe not the only, but maybe like a couple of others. And so I was really working a lot with architects to learn about how to use AutoCAD, and I was teaching my peers how to use AutoCAD. And there was a block of flats near, and I decided to do my dissertation on a block of flats, a modernist block of flats that was near um, the university. And there's a, in Melbourne in the 19... 50s and 60s, there was this ring of slums around <coughs> Melbourne. And so when modernist housing of the type that Le Corbusier and people like him were working on, they, was, they, de they demolished all of these slums and they built these series of towers. And those towers were really amazing because when you flew into the city, you had this low fabric of, of two to five storeys, or two to, four, two to three storeys really across the whole city, and then you had these 20 story towers that were in a ring that marked the development of the city, the growth of the city where the slums used to be. And they were, they were trying to demolish them because they thought they were an eyesore. And I was at that stage very contrary. And so I said, no, we shouldn't demolish them because they're really important to the history of the city. We should conserve them, but we should try to fix them up. And so I, I used a heritage argument, which is that um, things have heritage value if they've been seen to be in to have been influenced by an important event time or, or um, period. And so I really tried to analyse this thing. And I was interested in this idea they called, that one of my teachers called dim resonance, which is to say that when you live in the colonies, everything is like a resonance of somewhere else. And so you're growing, you've got a tower that's like the Corbusier, but it's not done by the Corbusier because it's done by somebody who's copying America or copying... Um, England or copying Europe and I thought the place has no character itself it's like a copy of a copy of a copy it's like a sampling or it's a remix of something and so what I did was I decided to work out what these sites were as a remix and I developed this method where I analyzed a series of these um, prototypical types of, of modernist public housing and I developed this series of criteria in terms of their the development type, their sort of geometry, movement types. And then I overlaid the previous street pattern that had been demolished on top of the current um, high rise. And I then said, um, you know, this feet here, which is an old lot that used to be there before these were built, was, you know, because of these criteria resembles most this particular type of development. And so this is where it gets quite crazy. Because then what I did was I, I used this digital sort of technique and it was really about auto-sketching. And so I then, for example, I would get the original plan. I would, I would then 
sort of, um, I would rescale a part of it and then I would basically find a fragment of it and then I would collage that fragment back onto the site. And through this process, and I'm not advocating this as a process, but this is what I did. Um, through this process of basically sampling and reorganising and, and looking at what was being appropriated for each one of these places, according to these criteria, I then basically came up with this rather strange um, aggregate crazy plan, which was looked a bit like this. And so from that, I then tried to then sort of work my way across that plan and say, okay, let's, let's work our way in amongst all of these fragments and find and reimpose these different sorts of types into that landscape to deal with some issues that had come up a lot of the time when people sort of reflected on on um, public housing, which a lot of the time were around the idea that there's not enough privacy in those public housing typologies. So the ground plane is really big. Nobody owns the ground plane because there's such a high population and therefore what happens is that it becomes a kind of no man's land. This is in Australia. And so through that I then tested each one of these types and I was using 3D Studio, which then became Max, and I produced these sort of rather macabre looking kind of landscape spaces um, in amongst all of this collaged landscape where I tried to then work with this stuff. Now, I, in retrospect, I don't think that these designs are particularly interesting. Um, and it was really much more about the process at that point in time. I then went through and, and looked at from this configuration what the new population densities would be in that site um, and basically argued that I made the site functional. Um, we maintained the existing populations where they were and then I looked at how, for instance, by reanalyzing it again, how different spaces had different levels of public and privateness and what that did to the kind of circulation through it. And it turns into a sort of strange this strange thing. Now this is like 1995. Finally what I did was I then reflected on my whole project and kind of critiqued, critiqued what resulted from, from it and was using it to reflect back and ultimately I decided that my project had failed. And so um, after having done that and moving with this model that was really popular at the time around design generation, I, started, I completely rejected that model and so I, I, in a way, I gained a sort of a sense of how to, uh, I had this sort of digital model that I was working with. I had this way of working with, um, uh, with these architectural technologies um, and very abstract. And when I finished, I realised my, during my degree in that period in the university I was at, I had never designed any landscape. And so in actual fact, I'd been at university for, for three years. I never designed any landscape and I had this weird sense of, I'd come a long way from being a gardener, sweeping paths and planting gardens to doing something abstract like that. But I really had no strong sense of landscape. And so I chose deliberately to move away from the digital, even though that's what I got my first job says. And I started to work with a practice that basically when I presented my thesis, there was a guy called Chris Rizel and he was um, developing a, a small practice called Aspect in Melbourne. And he saw my presentation and said, we're trying to use computers and do some interesting stuff. We want to diversify our business. Do you want to come and work for us? And I, because I had this knowledge about computers, I managed to get a job at the university at RMIT teaching computers initially. And so I was working part-time at the university and part-time in practice. And that's something I've done the whole of my career. And so the first job, because of the fact that I had been working on this project and and my supervisor was a South African guy called Leon Van Skyk, who's some of you guys who are South African might know from Van Skyk's bookstore. He actually was the dean of the, of the, the faculty and he then said, do you want to work on this new project called the RMIT Technology Estate? And so I brought that project to Aspect and 
after having come from this really abstract way, I, I started to think I'm not interested anymore in this architectural model of landscape. I, 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 I felt that while I was interested in these techniques and it had been good fun, I wanted to get back to the roots of what is landscape, what is different about landscape to architecture. And so I began an investigation which has been happening through the whole of my career, which has been around trying to get to understand the raw material of landscape, which is topography, plants, really, and what's different about them. And so working on this, this site, which was this, this piece of, of catchment in, out on the edge of Melbourne, um, we really were trying to work with this site in a way that where the development of the site was really focused on um, was really focused on the existing site characters, and so, for example, what we were doing was we were analysing the existing um, or analysing all of the existing topography, and I came up with with this sort of to, to, uh, typology of talking about the landscape in terms of things that were like plateaus, what I call topographic waterfalls, which is when you're looking across the landscape and suddenly the topography changes and you see a horizon line. And I call this a topographical waterfall because it's sort of like the topography is falling off an edge. The flanks of the, the slope, the hollows, spurs, etc. And so I said that these techniques or these understandings of the landscape should be used to develop the entire... Um, development. And as you can see, I followed a method that was not dissimilar to my dissertation, and I was working here very strongly with a, a woman, Kirsten Bauer, who was who was a colleague of mine at Aspen, and who was one of my long-time collaborators, um, and a guy, Sasha Coles, who then went on to found the Sydney office of Aspect with me, was also working on this project. And so, with starting from the landscape and looking at topography, vegetation, and these landscape types. We then proposed these series of different types of, of, um, of models for how uh, the landscape could work. And so, for example, we said that on the edge of these topographic waterfalls where the landscape is, there's a transition into the bottom of the valley, we're going to create these, um, this sort of boulevard treatment that has a highly formalised edge and we're going to maintain these, these sort of things that we called landscape strips, which were that even though we're building very highly on the landscape, we're going to maintain a kind of a, a relationship across the top of this landscape so that you always have a connection across the building development site to the landscape below, this sort of open space connection. Um, and um, as you can see, it was also really tied to the drawings that, that I was producing at that time. And so the, the, the sort of overall configuration of the project ended up being something like this, where we really as retained as much of the existing landscape as possible, where we demarcated a clear boundary of development um, and where we tried to sort of uh, embed the landscape into the development. So this was the sort of thing I was working on. And that sense of of playing with topography and playing with landscape was something that 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 uh, came to dominate a lot of my work. Another project from that period with Aspect was this um, project. It was a competition. I was doing a lot of competitions, and this was a competition for uh, a muse uh, art gallery site called um, uh, the Heidi Gallery in Melbourne. And as you can see, this is a period where we're on the cusp where the computer and with hand techniques were just crossing over each other. And so, for example, this drawing here was a hand collage of basically you're kind of printing, a, printing an aerial photo onto a piece of transparency. And then, you're, then we have these CAD elements that we're physically, physically cutting and pasting and splicing into that thing. And it was an art gallery, and so we had these ideas of these sort of gestures in the landscape that that sort of structured smaller spaces in this site and then in our in our overall sort of planning of the of the building complexes we sort of tried to really um, use the slope and use the transitions through the landscape and in the drawings 
you know, we basically, the whole project was one kind of continuous section that we used to sort of show that relationship all the way up the landscape um, into the gallery spaces, etc. Um, across these two relationships that we called the expansive and the intimate. Um, while we were at Aspect, we also, you know, because I was at the university, we were getting to work in quite a, a, uh, a sort of speculative way where people would ask us to work on projects that were um, difficult. And this is one of my problems is that I've always given, been given difficult projects and half of them don't fly because the projects are too difficult. And so this is a project that we did with a practice called Deep End. Deep End were, a, were people who'd been come to Australia to work on Federation Square. I don't know if people might be aware of Federation Square in Melbourne. It's a major project undertaken by Dutch landscape architects. And so in this project, this road was incredibly, it was like a very dense road. And they had this, this idea about greening, greening, inverted commas. And so... What we see is there's really actually no space for greening. The, street, the sidewalk is completely full of services. There's no, there's no, there's canopies above. There's no ability to make the sidewalks wider. And so how are you going to green something when there's no ability to grow plants? And so what we came up with was this idea of, we called it the ductile hedge. And what it meant was... Hi, hi. Um, the ductile hedge was really a, uh, a, a sort of an idea of working in the leftover spaces in the street section. So if you can imagine you've got a street section where there's a canopy above and a footpath below and there's literally no space to fit anything. And we said, first of all, we're going to do a series of sections and we're going to work out where, where the leftover space is and that's where the greening is going to go. And our initial idea was to produce this thing called a ductile hedge. And the ductile hedge was really to say that we're going to produce a structure which is um, made of steel in some way, and it's a framework, and it could be a piece of street furniture, and we're going to grow inside it um, noxious weed, basically a noxious weed, a plant that you cannot, you cannot kill. And, uh, and we're going to basically have this idea that it'll have the appearance of greening, and it'll produce microclimate, and it'll produce some separation between the street and the, the city. But in actual fact, it's going to be um, highly artificial greening. And so with that in mind, we worked with an industrial designer, and we began developing this uh, ductile hedge out of um, a stainless steel mesh and uh, a planter with, a, with this sort of structure inside so that the plants would grow up to the edge of this and you could prune the plants back to that guide. And so um, the idea was that that changed form and so we then, some of them became planters, others of them, as you can see, had different sorts of things and some of them became three-dimensional um, armatures that would grow up inside the landscape. Now, one of the problems we faced at that point in time was that that the council had a really big indigenous plants thing going on and basically this scheme relied upon having a, a very, very vigorous plant. It couldn't exist in that location. And so the plants we were proposing were essentially exotic plants that were really tough and instead they chose to use um, indigenous plants that weren't able to survive in this location. So the whole premise of greening, we said you can't green it, this environment is too tough. And so instead, um, try this, and ultimately the project lasted for about six years and got pulled out and they never tried to put plants back in Sydney Road ever again. So this was this period I was working in, uh, and I think the main thing when I look back on it is, and the thing I appreciated most is, always having a kind of a strategic agenda that comes from an analytical approach of site. And so whether it be analysing topography and understanding the way that the topographic nature of the site works and utilising that to help us structure the development envelope, whether it be reading the constraint of the... Um, reading the constraints of the envelope um, to be able to work out how those... Uh, 
um, how much space was in play and really understanding what was at play, but really taking a strategic angle into the design, not starting from convention, but starting from a strategy and then substituting into that strategy. And whenever you had to make a decision, going back to the strategy all the time to say, well, this is our strategy. What's now the right approach if our budget changes, if the situation changes? At RMIT, I was still teaching there. And at that stage, they developed a model that was, was called um, design research. And so design research was a different type of, um, a kind of different mode of um, research. Because design research says that when we undertake design research, we are um, really, we're learning through doing. And so design research generally has three uh, aspects to it. One of them is design is research for design, which is to say, I'm doing something through des a design, I need to know this to do it, which is the conventional model, which is we do some research, we do some design. Then there's research about design, which is to say we're evaluating and understanding design methods. We're looking deeper into the design process. And then there's research by design, which is to say that when we design something, we are actually researching as we're designing. And I'm in a classic example with that, and that's how studio works. The best way to learn a car park, to design a car park, is you could have a guidebook on how to design car parks until you've sat there and tried to work out how to fit this many, how to maximise the spaces and all that stuff and the turning circles. You won't ever know about car parks until you do that. And so you're actually researching car parks while you're designing. This makes sense if you think about it like that. And so really this model was about trying to um, evaluate your existing practice. And so in that period, I went through with this idea, if you consider what I talked about my, my undergraduate. And back then, back then, the undergraduate was the same as the undergraduate and the master's. So, you did four years, and that gave you a professional qualification. And so this was my research master's. And what I did was I said, I want to learn more about the raw stuff of landscape. And because I'd been using the computer and using, using so much topographic modelling, I said, I want to learn to draw like a computer. And so I began a process of utilising... Um, the, the representation te um, techniques of the computer to draw by hand. And so I was really developing these, these different sorts of models and exploring how, as I say here, you know, the computer taught me how to draw. And so <clears throat> what I, I did was I kind of went through a series of these drawing exercises as a ways of trying to get a handle on, on how topography was kind of working and I came up with these sort of typologies of topography and so for example I was looking at things like and making models for how topography worked and before I go that I suppose an example of how I'm testing here is I'm testing representation where I'm saying here is the kind of a normal mesh now here is that same mesh where we've hidden the verticals and just worked with the horizontals. Here's the same mesh where we've worked with just the verticals and not the horizontals. And I developed this idea that how we draw something affects how we design it, which is there's always a relationship between representation and design generation. It's not just I'm drawing, it's how I draw affects what I design. It's an idea that's very it's common in art, but not so common in, um, in landscape at that time, you know. Other examples of that were using different, analysing and how different techniques show the landscape in different sorts of ways. Here is one, one sort of technique where just another way of drawing that same surface gives you a totally different sense of its extent. In this technique at the top here, it's like everything is funneling towards the centre. This technique, which is similar to the Capodoglio, it makes sense that the surface is moving to the side. And so this was really, I was playing a lot with these sort of ideas. And similarly, I was also looking at developing ideas around uh, little exercises and kind of esquises around topography. In my studio teaching, I was running design studios, which we were playing with soil, because I was interested in how do we use the actual material of landscape? Do we engage with soil as soil? Do we really work with it in any way? And so in the studio that we, I ran called 
um, terrain ops. We really looked at soil by playing with different levels of saturation and trying to explore what happens when soils break and when they fall apart and what happens if you design around that idea. You know, I was also doing things like exploring um, universal access as a, and saying how do we engage with topography and universal access, what's, what happens with that, and developing models of, of experience and what I called experiential catchment, which is that in landscape, when we're inside a space defined by topography, it's like being in an interior. We can get a, we see where the sense of internality is, for example, our, our relation of our height to those things, and therefore that means that each space that we move through is actually opening up and closing into a different space. And so as a part of this, this is all a process of me evaluating existing projects, and so uh, in the end of that process, um, in the end of that process, I really, uh, I sort of did this as part of my master's. I, I did this exhibition where we, let me find it through here. Yeah, and so I sort of developed this digital interface, this sort of weird model that brought together all of the projects into these kind of sections that brought together all of the projects, and then I had this exhibition where it was really a sort of like a, uh, a series of these sort of sectional profiles hung in space. After that, in a design competition, I then also continued to, to play with those models. Uh, ultimately, the competition was given to someone else, but you know, we also played, for example, in the design of that project with how to articulate topography in different sorts of ways, use of physical models, um, uh, sketching, etc., photographing, photographing clay models, collaging, 3D, etc. And so that aspect of that was a that was my master's research after a few years. And one of the things that was quite interesting was that my parents were both historians, uh, conventional historians, and they said to me when I showed them my master's research, they said, "It's not exactly conclusive. It's not like real research. It's not like scientific research, is it?" It's, it's, it's something else, you know? And so this is my, my, my 70 something year old parents telling, who, who are historians saying, you know, it's not really research, really, is it? And so I had this schizophrenic moment of going, you know, I've come through a tradition of design, which was all like, all really in this kind of mode, very abstract, very strategic, um, very exploratory, which was great, but I had really had no experience with conventional research. And so if you can see how each time I go through and I reject what I previously know as my strategy is always, you know, I've come from an indigenous plants angle where it's all touchy-feely hippie stuff, then I've gone to hard, weird architectural design generation. And so after that period, I, I kind of, because my, my project had, had been digital in this sort of way of, of this sort of design generation process, I had some particular thoughts about the relationship of the digital to landscape architecture. And during this time, this movement, which we'd all probably know now, which is landscape urbanism, arose. And so I wrote the first review of land, that book, Landscape Urbanism. And because of my dissertation, I was very concerned by this because I felt that it missed out on key parts of landscape. Because ultimately, in this dissertation, I wasn't doing anything apart from drawing, representation. And so I'm thinking, here we are with representation, but in the landscape we work with real stuff, stuff that grows, real things that grow over time. And so these landscape urbanism was trying to do things where, for example, they would get a map an existing force, maybe movement, maybe transport patterns, and then they would basically extrapolate that into a form and they would say because the form was generated from these crazy systems somehow those crazy systems are part of the design but I said if it's just a representation and nothing really changes it's not really about change it's like a drawing of change and I've already been doing that that's what I did and that's how I know it doesn't work because it's ultimately just a drawing what happens to the landscape what's interesting about landscape is change what's interesting about landscape is that Somebody comes and messes up your design, the plant grows, it affects the environment. Things merge around each other, and if we think that we can just deal with them by drawing them, 
we're missing something very, very important. And so with that in mind, um, I had a kind of family disaster. My father passed away, and so I made the decision to, um, to go and visit meet my English family, and I began travelling through um, the places and the great projects that I wanted to know about um, to sort of say I'm sick of representations, I'm sick of trusting what people say about projects, I want to visit these projects. I don't want to just actually trust that they're the same as I'm told they are. And so this is why the stu my students will know that I only show projects of projects that I've visited. I don't show projects that are drawings because I need to be able to know what they're really like, otherwise I'm just, I just may as well be Google searching. And so, you know, over that process I started to visit a range of projects that were um, operating in a way that I was interested in. And one of the main ways you could say was this aspect of change. So, for example, this project by Gustav Lange here in Berlin, on the old Berlin Wall, they stopped maintaining the project because they ran out of money. And so what happened is the landscape started to regenerate. Um, people started to appropriate the landscape. They started to graffiti walls. And in a way, the landscape turned into a totally different sort of thing. And, and Lana said, when they said, your project's being destroyed, I mean, this is what it looked like when I first visited it in 96, and that's what it looked like later. Lana said, well, that's love. Love in the landscape is, is, is everyday usage. If people love a place, they kind of destroy it through that love, and that's what I'm interested in. Another guy I was interested in called Gilles Clement was using mowing to shape growth. He was saying, rather than just plant something, let's use maintenance techniques. Similarly, this guy, Pascal Cribier, was you know, planting plants in the ground and then using mowing patterns to allow some plants to grow in some places and plants to grow in others. You know, people were using this guy, Langer, again, who did this project where he hacked out a piece of ground, a piece of stone, put it in the landscape, and then what happened is that as it as it rained and water got into these cracks and the froze, it smashes the rock apart and then plants start growing in it and eventually the whole rock completely disappears over time. And so it's like a registration of change. And for me, the kind of projects were projects, I mean, there's another example of one of those projects. It may start as form, but by the end of it, it's transformed into something completely different because it engages a landscape process. And for me, this is landscape. Landscape is about transformation over time. But how do we do that? And so that became one of my main, my main ambitions after that, was to look at how we do that. I went to, I decided, no, I'm going to leave Melbourne, and I'm going to move to a city called Brisbane. And because my parents had decided that I wasn't a real researcher, I'm going to do an old-fashioned PhD. Like, I'm going to do... a a PhD that's like with a proper historian and theoretician and I'll move to Brisbane. But what happened was that I got there and I've been working so hard during this period because if you consider that during in, in the 80s there, the reason I ended up gardening is that I completely messed up my life. And so I'd actually, like I won't go, it's very personal, but I had completely messed up my life. Then I'd gone to Melbourne and tried to make up for lost time. And so when I got to Brisbane, I actually, I got a PhD scholarship to work with this guy, John MacArthur, and I basically, I was travelling and visiting projects, and my topic that, about this idea of change was very topical, and I was getting invited all over the world to give lectures, and I kind of wasted my scholarship, and so I didn't finish my PhD. And so what then happened is I had to get a job, and so I got a job working at this university called QUT and working for some architects called Donovan Hill Architects, who asked me to start a landscape company for them, much the same as Aspect had done. And I founded their Sydney office with uh, Sasha Coles. And so working for Aspect was in and working for Donovan Hill was interesting because it was the boom time of the 2000s, before the global financial crisis. It was a really rocky kind of time to be around. And I was getting a chance to play with things that really interested me. For example, I was working on projects where, um, for things like this project, which is for this art gallery in the middle of the desert in Australia, uh, which was where I was using 
I was working with different techniques that I was exploring in my masters, and I was playing around with this. Had this landscape had no water, it had um, it was all rock, and so I became interested in doing a landscape design that was based entirely out of rock, and so I was noticing how how as I say, there are variations on rock in this landscape. And so using kind of mounding um, and piling of, ro of rock um, and playing with the kind of colours of this sort of vegetation in that landscape, I was using the kind of these piles of rock to organise the site plan. And so as you can see here, you know, this is also a period when we start to have cell phones. And so at that you know, stage, I was doing a lot of stuff like make a physical model, take a photo, print the photo out, collage on top of the photo, write on top of it. And so using these piles of rock here to structure where car parks were going to go, where different things were, were working. And then also playing around with, um, you know, playing around with the fact that in this landscape, when you have the difference between wet and dry is really large. And so on some of these sort of big bush, big sort of farmer gardens, you had the situation where through bores, you had a landscape which was totally red with nothing. And then when you put in a tiny amount of irrigation, you have this kind of oasis. And so in the design, we played around with this idea that there was a kind of, there was only one piece of green, which was inside the the centre of that landscape, and instead all of the rest was rock. And so as you entered through the building, you emerged into the oasis of green, and the rest is just rock everywhere around, and the rock structures the circulation into the site. And so also, you know, was also playing around and looking at things like how just, you know, this is an example where a tractor turning with a grading blade would create enough microclimate that plants would grow just through scarifying the ground. And if you consider I was interested in this idea of technique, mowing and these kind of things, the idea that just how you use the implement of the grader might change the microclimate and cause things to regenerate was something that I was really, really interested in. And so... At the same time, also, I developed, I was starting to become interested from the projects I'd done with Aspect in um, the fact that landscapes, landscapes are leftover, right? We all know this and it's a sad fact, but a lot of the time landscape is the leftover. And so a lot of the decisions about, about what happens in the landscape come through uh, processes outside of your control. As soon as the envelope of the ownership happens, you're working inside something. But we all know from our landscape planning that landscape is connected to everything. So how do we reconcile that we're only allowed to work in this little bit when the system that we're working with just keeps going? And so that problem is something that I've put a lot of time into. And so ultimately I've decided, and this is some of my future research, is that we have to move right the way back and look at land ownership. And if we don't look at land ownership and the shape of land ownership, we're not going to be able to work with the landscape forces. And so I had an opportunity working with Donovan Hill where I, um, I was working on these big subdivisions because there was a boom, this was boom time in Australia. And so using the similar techniques that I was using in this Janefield project, I started to sort of say, well, let's start the development by working in catchments and understand what's happening in catchments. Let's... Let's work with views, let's work with different senses of space. And from that, <laughs> utilising some of the methods that I've been working with on, um, on uh, uh, in Melbourne, I was using a lot of the time using, for instance, collage. So I was getting these lots, and then I was starting to look at how those lots sat within and could be realigned and reorganised in relationship to those... those uh, the shape of the landscape, and then, you know, from this, uh, from those collages, we developed this, um, this uh, sort of master plan for the development that allowed for agricultural land to be maintained and turned into amenity, 
that worked with the spaces created by topography, that maintained the amount of lots that they wanted. So the developer said, I want X many lots. And I said, well, if we can provide X many lots, can we do what you like? And they were like, yep. And so it was really about trying to find ways to use those lots to maintain the existing character of the landscape. And then working with the ways that the different infrastructure typologies and setbacks of the architecture would then strengthen those landscape, um, those landscape relations. And similarly, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me is that that I had come through a thing where the school I was in was very architecturally orientated. And I'd come from a landscape and I'd rejected landscape and I'd gone architecture, architecture, architecture. But in the same way I'd worked with topography, I became interested in saying, instead of saying, I'm, you know, I want to be more than plants, I want to, plants are not enough, I started to become really interested in, well, let's really see what we can actually do with plants. And so I did a number of projects with these guys, Donovan Hill, where I started to sort of develop a kind of strategic model for, for how plants would work. And this site was a resort that was actually going to be in a very arid part of Australia. And so I developed this kind of model with the architects for how different plants and organisations of plant typologies would set up different sorts of relations. So, for example, certain plants that you'd look through to the view, certain plants that would block block the, the view, certain plants that would provide height to a certain level, really focusing literally all the way around the building on what the configuration of the interior and exterior relations is going to be about. And really say, you know, as Petra Blaze, the interior designer from Inside Outside would say, landscape is a dialogue between interior and outside where the window is and the curtain is like a, a mediation between those two. And so after I developed this kind of system on an individual level, you know, we then, I then sort of extrapolated it across the whole site um, to show how that came together in total. So, for example, if you see that, that, that one lot there, and then you look at how that plays out at scale, you end up in these certain relations. And so the idea was in maintaining all of these my first job was maintaining all of these pieces of existing vegetation and then playing with the views inside and outside. They were very, very good architects and so some of the, the architecture itself was really interesting. They have this, they, they were prefabricated modules they were working with called happy houses and they were really um, like you have, this is a container sized module, gets dropped in by a crane, dropped into place you have that module and then you have two smaller modules and then you have a deck in between that they called, they did so many of these, they were known as ODRs, which is outdoor rooms. And so, for example, you can see how in this situation you have, that's the main living module, then they have these two other modules configured around a, a sort of a deck and here are these different planting configurations all related to that. And so, working with those guys, I, I gained a, a strong appreciation for um, for working with what's at hand. And I also, you know, I, I mean, I also got to build a lot of gardens for their projects, by, and I had a strong kind of design review um, role with that practice. So I got to work on how the buildings were laid out to relate to landscape, how views worked with them, and I got to, I got to work very closely with those, um, you know, those architects. And they were also happy for me to take opportunities in how to represent different sorts of, um, uh, to explore representation. And so this is one of the gardens that, that we did, that, that I did with them, which is called, um, it's in the tropics, right? So this is the reason it's got this sort of lush thing. While most people were busy trying to reject tropical vegetation and reject colour, a lot of the time I was working with it really closely. And, and, um, and so, for instance, we we're also working with, you know, these interior spaces inside the building. So this is like a courtyard inside the middle of the building. And so I was also working, I selected, I've worked with these guys helping the selection of the finishes, etc., in relationship to those, um, to those gardens and these interior sort of spaces. Eventually though, eventually though I had to get back to the PhD. And, uh, and so after things happened again in my life and each time something shakes something up and with a combination of 
of uh, my mother passing away and uh, end of a long-term relationship, I realised that I'd let this whole period here of the trajectory of what I'd been working on take over and it was time to actually finish, the, finish my PhD. And so um, the PhD was called um, Novelty in the Entropic Landscape, Landscape Architecture, Gardening and Change. And um, it was really work, it was about the, uh, this is the, you know, this is the table of contents, but it was really about three, three different um, models of change, you could say. And so three case studies. And the first case study was, was this one, which is the is Mosbach Paysagists and the Bordeaux Botanic Gardens. And I mean, even though it took me 10 years to finish my PhD because I was doing these other projects with these companies, what in actual fact was interesting is that if you're talking about change, you have to see it. If my main premise that landscape urbanism was simulating change, then you have to see what happens. And so all of the projects I discussed, I visited multiple times over a 10 year period and documented what changed from what the designer thought was going to happen to what happens in reality. And I analysed how the designer had or hadn't worked with change over time. Because as, as you may not know now, but you will know when you go into practice, maintenance or no maintenance can destroy everything in landscape. A project can be gorgeous and be gone within a year. And so the ability to catalyse maintenance is such a fundamental thing. And so this project took a different point of view. And I was trying to argue that even when we're talking about change, we don't have to just be talking about growth. Inorganic things change as well. And so, for instance, Mosbach in this project designed the series of um, mounds that were designed to erode. So as they, as rain fell onto them, the, the, as you can see at the top here, you know, Mosbach made them by assembling soil profiles, faking soil profiles, and then planting on top of them. And as, for instance, water ran across the top surface, it eroded and below, for instance, plants started to move. And as you can see, even though they were designed to change, the people who then managed them, this was kind of terrifying to them and so they ended up fencing it off. And so you can see that that's a demonstration about the fact that, that change is also a threat. And we, so on the one hand, you know, on the one hand, landscape's about change, but too much change is a bad thing. And this is the same with why we don't like exotic plants. We want our plants to survive, but if they are actually doing too well, then that's a bit crazy, right? They're taking over, the plants are taking over. So what's, what, what do we want? We want the perfect plant, stays in the right place, doesn't do the too much, doesn't threaten anything. But if we get that wrong, it just dies, or it becomes a weed. Which, which way are we gonna play with this? Do we want the dynamics of landscape or do we not? And so I looked at the inorganic, uh, inorganic processes, and then I also looked at maintenance and said, Here's a project where, because I'm very much trying to say, I'm not trying to say it's either design or it's all everything goes process. It has to be somewhere between those two. And so I looked at a project, another one which was by um, Svenning Veranderson, where in the, in the um, 1980s he designed and built this garden. And over time, basically when it was planted, it was all hedges that were pruned like this. But over 30 years, it turned into all of these very diverse spaces on the basis of how it was maintained. So they started off as little hedges, and then he would let them grow. Some of them he would let them grow. Others he would keep pruning them. And so some of them grew long and leggy as they started to get competition for light to move at the top. And so then it's more like the trees have sculptural effects where we're looking at their trunks. Other situations, they keep getting pruned to have views through... Um, you know, they, we have situations where, you know, one side of the plant looks like it's, it's a filigree of, to be looked through of the trunk, etc., and the other side of that plant is actually, you know, a pristine hedge. And so I was really interested in the fact that the plan didn't change. Over time, if you redrew the plan, which I did, it's exactly the same plan as that. But what changed? The spaces changed radically. In architecture, you design it, the spaces result from design. In this project, the spaces resulted from maintenance. So you would have only been able to do this through thinking about and working with maintenance. My final project I looked at was another inorganic one, 
where this guy Louis Ledois literally would just pile pile stone and or brick, and as that would be uh, as that would create microclimates, plants would then colonise that landscape. And he said, "I do culture. I pile stuff up. Nature does nature. It just comes in afterwards." So instead of us saying, I'll specify the plant, we say, I create the microclimate, I'll let the plant come. We un and to do this, we have to understand the direction of wind, we have to understand rain pockets, we have to understand that what we do first is create microclimate. And this is one of the reasons why we're interested in these churches here, is because of the fact that those churches here are all about microclimate. Like you go to the churches and you look at the trees there, and it's incredibly about microclimate, and it's one of the things that really interests me. So from that, you know, that was the PhD. And it was also had a bit more complex stuff about this idea about a big fight I'm having with landscape urbanism about, about process and simulation. But since that time, I then started to work on a book from that. And this is currently, this book is currently um, about to come out. Uh, and it's a book called Overgrown Practices Between Landscape Architecture and Gardening. And it's... Uh, it's the, put out by the MIT Press, and I applied for a funding through the Graham Foundation, and so that book is going to come out soon. It's got different things, but it's got a number of, of, of common sections. One is about, one is called figuring growth, which is the idea of that we're working with a dynamic medium, and when we design something, we're not just specifying a location, we're specifying a starting point for change. When you do a planting plan, you're specifying something that starts and then transforms. And so in a way, how do we work with that? And so the first part is about the idea of, of how things persist in the landscape um, and, and really design-based ideas where we work from representation into an outcome. And the second half is about working from um, on-site decisions and designing with on-site decisions. And I coined this term that is the veridic. And the veridic, if you know in architecture, the tectonic. I don't know if you guys from architecture would know this term, the tectonic. The tectonic in architecture refers to the idea of how something's built. You could say the tectonic of this building is, is post and beam, or the tectonic of this building is something or other. And I thought, what's the... And then they would say the tectonic is also about how the structure works in relationship to the material. And I thought, what if we try to think of something like that for landscape? And the term viridus in Latin means green, but it also means spring. And spring is always about change. And so I developed this model for landscape architecture, which is about plant materials that I call the viridic, and that's the focus of the book. In the, in the book, you know, one of my research assistants, Michael Brown, has been working with me to develop these kind of icons that for each project demonstrate how the project works and these are the kind of dividers the dividers for the the book for each chapter that sort of try to lay out how um, how each each chapter is really working there's one of the gardeners in the pocket in Scotland you can kind of guess that um, yeah and so that's the that's where I've sort of that's that's that book happened since I moved to South Africa but it really closes a closes a door on on a period of my life that's been about 15 years worth of research um, and practice. And if you think about the fact that over that body of work, I've explored topography and tried to really look at how topography as a medium structures landscape, how we can work with topography, which is really that whole part of my, of my research through here. But ultimately, this book here is also about reconciling the experience of being a gardener from the very beginning with being a landscape architect and going from working one-to-one -one with my hands to going to a point where I'm working with drawings. And so that's why the chapter plan is organised as it is, because of the fact it's really talking about that two-dimensional process, working with your hands versus working on a drawing. Because ultimately, if we're designing and we be, we're literal, we don't make anything, we draw something, someone else makes it. And so how do we reconcile the fact that everything else that's exciting is going to happen afterwards? We have to break that dynamic down. And a lot of that is going to be about working on site. You know, a lot of older landscape architects barely do drawings. They only do drawings for either 
legislative reasons or for costing an estimation. And after that, everything is working with the contractor. You know, you need to be, with landscape, you really need to be in a situation where if something's coming up and then you go, oh my God, I forgot that view, you can say, move it, move this over, out of the way. In architecture, once the foundation's on its way, it's over. And so landscape allows that flexibility. It doesn't fall down, it's already down. So anyway, so when I moved to South Africa, one of the things, obviously, it was a very different experience for me. And so through the process of, and I mean, I can't say I had any, I never thought I was going to end up in South Africa. My teachers were South African, and they used to talk about this place, the Drakensberg, which I've never, still never been to. I met a South African girl. I got bored of Australia. I decided to go to South Africa. And so during the process of knowing it through my students' dissertations, I got to go to a, um, I got to go to this place called Europe, which is an informal settlement outside of, um, on the, in the Cape Flats in Cape Town. And um, the projects that we were working there were, mo were mostly from a student called Amy Thompson, and they were really related to formalising housing. And a lot of it was tied to some of this previous work I'd done around lock boundaries, etc. But through walking through that landscape, or walking through the informal settlement, I became really interested and I noticed that there were actually these gardens in that, in that uh, informal settlement. And so um, with Amy Thompson and myself, a photograph called Jared, a photographer called Jared Kutsia, Tazama Mputa, who was one of my students, and Michael Brown, who was also one of my students, we began a kind of collective project called the Gardens of Europe. And this is my next book that I'm working on, where we started to say, in a way, catalyzing some of my gardening understanding to look at how um, what we can learn from um, the way that people are operating in situations where, you know, you would almost not expect um, things to be able to grow at all. In fact, um, and also where the relationships between plants are not the way we'd otherwise want them to be. There's also dynamics around movement. And so, for example, Sakila, who is the gentleman um, up here, whose garden we're talking about there, you know, one thing that we really noticed was that Sakila, you know, he lives here, but he's travelling in crazy kind of ways around, around the city to try to make his living as a gardener. And so there's also a dynamic around um, place and origin and all of these things. So, for example, a lot of a lot of uh, of people living in Cape Town come from the Eastern Cape. Some of our students come from the Eastern Cape. And so we're also really interested in what's the dynamic that's happening between those um, gardens that people might have in the Eastern Cape and what's happening in this informal settlement. And so, um, you know, we tried to sort of treat those gardens as special and sort of draw them and map them and try to understand where water points were working, what plants were growing, and in a way to try to tell, tell a very different story about landscape in Cape Town. And so one of, we've, bit by bit, we've been planting, or not planting, writing, um, articles about this, and they're about to sort of move towards this book. And so <clears throat> another one of those is quite interesting, is I... I worked on, this is a, a painting by Tazama Mbuta, and this here uh, was really looking at one particular plant called Mirabilis uh, jalapa. It's a weed. It's a noxious weed, according to the government. And so it's interesting to me that it's a noxious weed, but, but this guy Sam here, it's, it's, he wouldn't have a garden if it weren't for that noxious weed. And his appreciation of that plant is on the basis of its qualities. It's pink, it's got beautiful flowers, and it's got a story. And the story is that he moved to Cape Town 35 years earlier to, um, and he, he, he was one of the earliest settlements, settlers on this tip site. And he, um, in that process, he, uh, he set up this shack and his wife only visited him once in 35 years because the family could not afford, he was sending money back, you know. And when she came once on the way, on the, in the bus, she picked up all of these seeds from this marvellous jalapa plant. And when she turned up to his place, just after he'd built it, she spread the seeds on the ground, and they, they became this hedge here. And so it's, in a way, it's a story. The hedge is a story of 
that of his relationship, of his economic circumstance, of all of those things. And so I looked at that trip. If you think about that trip of the plant from the Eastern Cape, I thought, let's look at the history of that plant, Mirabilis jalapa. And it actually comes, it's called uh, the flower of Peru. And it originally came from Peru. And so Christopher Columbus, the botanist from Christopher Columbus, brought it back to Europe. And during that time, within 100 years of that point, it ended up in West Africa, naturalised in a forest to the point where it got recollected from that forest, sent back to Europe as an indigenous plant. And then they said, oh, actually, it's not an indigenous plant, it's from somewhere else. So it, it had found a home in Africa already. It arrived in Cape Town in about 1700 and... It's, it's just, I found this idea of its history really important. Now, interestingly, it's on the noxious weeds list, but actually it's a, its role is that it's, it's been found by, the, by people there at Europe to be a really good thing for um, uh, stomach problems in children. And so the, the Sangomas, uh, the traditional healers in um, Gugaletu are utilising this weed for its medicinal properties. Now it's an interesting thing that the colonist doesn't like the plant because it's colonised the landscape when they've colonised the landscape, but the local people have just accepted it and said it's got properties, it's pretty, it lives there, it grows on its own, it expands, we can use it for this, and what's more it's actually remediating the site. And so this is the dynamics around plants that we were quite, quite interested in. And so we're almost, we're almost at the end here. And so this is the next project that I'm working on. While I'm here, I'm also always working on... I've always maintained a, a sort of a, some sort of practice. And when we got here, one of the things I first, um, uh, I first noticed is I started, you know, I started getting invited by architects and friends to design their gardens, you know. And I noticed that the quality of contracting was not up to the standard that I expected. And so this is, I designed this garden for a, a friend. And because I'd been a contractor at the very beginning of this story, I thought, you know, I can build this myself. So in the last two years, I built this myself with Sakila, who is the guy from Europe. And I can work on, you know, he's already a good gardener. And so let's try to do some skill building kind of work. And... And in a way, you know, I've obviously, I mean, we, we, work, we started from, from, you know, this situation and we, we, you know, worked our way through. We dug into the ground of the site. So this is the thing also, you know, if we hadn't dug a hole in the site, we wouldn't have found all of this stone that's tied to the fact it's near the Higo Quarry. We would have put a design already in place and, and worked in a different way. And so ultimately, you know, we worked with the materials we found on site. Um, you know, we... we, we uh, worked with recycling all of the existing, um, all of the existing materials. We sort of bought up a little piece of, it, a, a, of an allotment next to the site, and then uh, you know we made this made this garden. And so at the same time, I you know I've always seemingly to be working. I worked on really weird things. Another project I've done recently. I work a lot with a with a company called Wolf Architects in in. Uh, Cape Town, and so they had done this thing called the watershed, and they were asked to do another project called the the wellness centre part of the watershed, but it's actually in the interior of the building. And so I was asked, "Can you design this and install it? And when you install it, um, can you guarantee the performance of the plant material?" And I said, "I cannot guarantee the performance of the plant material. The last garden I built there died because it wasn't maintained properly." So the only way I'm willing to do it is if I can work with artificial plants. And so I sort of, we did this project where we started to, to say, well, maybe we can work with, we can simulate an environment um, through a range of different sorts of measures uh, and to create spaces. And our first idea was really to, to, create, a, to create a kind of pot, a pot module that could interconnect with each other. So we started to have Tanya Kashner, a colleague of ours, her husband is a, is a concrete manufacturer, and so we started to work with this idea of this kind of modular planting system. 
and then with the idea of using curtains as a backdrop behind the, on the edge of the building so that you, you in a way looked at this backdrop and then you had these, these spaces configured. Now while we were setting this up, uh, we simulated one of these things and took it into the Wolf Architects and you can see we were using these milk crates here. And ultimately, Heinrich and I were looking at this thing and we said, why are we spending, you know, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of rands fabricating these things when it's entirely artificial anyway? All of these plants are made of plastic. And so we played, we came up with this idea of working with these milk crates and configuring, uh, configuring spaces with these, um, with these milk crates and these temporary plantings. And so again, because I'm you know, working with Sakile and his brother, etc., and we ultimately, um, Mike was a graphic designer, and so Mike and Jared, who I'm working on this project for with on the Gardens of Europe, we simulated this sort of, in a way, we set up a gantry and in Jared's studio, and we arranged these real plants underneath here, and then you know, here's Mike power arranging, and then ultimately Jared is photographing those uh, those plants, and then we rescaled it and we made these the curtains that hung behind uh, the back of the space, and then after that we then utilised we sort of set up these uh, these things, and even though it is highly artificial, we play once you you know if you know a little bit about plants and you begin the process of putting climbers with climbers and ferns with, and simulating a rainforest in there, ultimately the space ended up like, you know, ended up like this. And, uh, you know, it's artificial, but it's not pretending not to be artificial. And it goes back to my earlier project which I told you guys about, which was this, uh, this project of, of, of greening... Sydney Road, if you remember I told you about this project which is saying there is no space for green. How do we work with green? Is green microclimate? Is green uh, te textural quality? In a way, green has become an icon. People don't even care whether it's alive or dead. They care about a particular quality. And so in a way, that quality is what they're after. That microclimate is what they're after. And so let's play with that. And so just to, to finish up, two years ago, the Urban Design Program at UCT was uh, um, going to end, and it's had a long history, and landscape at UCT was going to end, and it was because that it got to the point where there were only three students in landscape architecture, and it was a master's program with two staff, the urban design program was ending, and I, um, my colleague Clinton Hines had actually been working so hard to run the program, he was exhausted, so I took over, convening the whole program. And um, I worked very hard to get students from, and the they are, some of them, um, from a whole lot of places. And so our students here, for example, you know, we have students from, you know, art. We have two students here from art. We have one student here from um, biology, environmental science. We have students from landscape technology. We have students from Pretoria from landscape architecture. And so I was really interested, I suppose, in diversifying program and also trying to change the, the constituency of the profession. And so with the urban design program, what I've been, if you consider the work I was talking about over here around subdivision and looking at the way that subdivision and landscape processes work together, the way that urban design um, and landscape work together, after all of this process of going from being a really digital guy, I've then I've then, in a way, gone through a whole period where I've been working mostly by hand, mostly using alternative methods. And so I, I, became, I came across something a few years ago called Grasshopper. And so I decided to kind of reconsider all of the, um, the status of digital, of digital discourse in landscape architecture. And I, I recently, in the magazine Journal of Landscape Architecture, I wrote a, comp a sort of a very comprehensive... Um, uh, review of digital, the status of digital technology and landscape architecture, looking at a range of different books. And particularly, in the end, coming to the idea that the stuff that is most interesting is really, at the moment, 
things that explore sensing, um, which is to say the things that allow feedback mechanisms. And if you think about my writing about gardening and my practice of gardening, my interest in my, my three things that came out of my, of my PhD, my three conclusions were, and I can only think of two of them right now, is that we have to have a feedback relationship with anything we do, which is we can't just design something and leave it. We have to develop a mechanism that allows for us to return so that we feed back into the design and develop the design over time. If we don't, we miss out, not just allow it to fail, we miss out on emerging opportunities. Um, that was one. <laughs> That's what I can think of right now, but um, now that I'm on the spot. And so I came across Grasshopper and I've, and I've been utilising it a lot in in urban design teaching, particularly around the idea of, of working from, the pu from public space outwards into the building envelope. And so in a way, rather than, there's sort of two ways you can work with, with these sort of, with, you know, the traditional way is that, that landscape is what's left over after building. But what if we treat urban design as the thing that structures the spaces um, that structures the building volume with an eye towards what the spaces are going to be. And so the nice thing about Grasshopper and parametric technology is you can begin to set up the parameters that push into the envelope. And that's one, that's one direction I've been working. And so, for example, we've been exploring the way that, that um, for example, treating the, city, treating the city as a solid, where where in a way it's a solid where the public space is cut out of the city. And then after that, breaking up that space into um, smaller volumes by understanding things like the parameters around shade, parameters around wind, parameters around yield, parameters around floor area ratios by colonising the leftover spaces um, from that sort of process. And so my next piece of research after the Gardens of Europe is really around this parametric understanding of um, urbanism and working with lot boundaries and understanding how the landscape is shaped by land ownership um, backwards. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's an overview of what I've been up to in the last 30 years. It doesn't include my teaching. And um, so, yeah.